there, it's Gary Parrish. Welcome back to CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, leaky black. Matt Norlander is here with me. If you're watching on YouTube, smash that like button like your Brandon Davis. You have consent. Don't forget why you're here to also subscribe to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel if you haven't done that already. Let's get into it. Obviously, it's been a busy weekend. We're going to get to all the biggest things eventually, but I did want to start on this Sunday night in Midtown Manhattan where one week after calling a good percentage of his roster laterally slow and or physically weak, Rick Pitino put on a brand new white suit and whipped Creighton inside the garden on Sunday afternoon. Final score, St. John's 80, Creighton 66, dead leg. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was last Sunday when you told the world, the entire world, the whole universe, that the Johnnies uh, were done and not making the NCAA tournament. I'm not <laughs> trying to start this. I'm not trying to start this uh, by putting you on old takes exposed, but uh, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Are you sure? Are you sure? I'm pretty sure. <laughs> if, if Listen, great job by Patino, uh, vintage to motivate his team. Uh, still not close to the cut line as we speak right now. So back on the like the win against against Creighton gets St. John's back into the NCAA tournament conversation, but no uh, well intentioned bracketologist would even remotely consider St. John's in the field as of Sunday night. But it was a good. That's not that's not that's not what that's not what anybody's saying. I didn't say they were in the field tonight. I said I don't think their at large dreams are dead. You proclaimed them dead last Did week. I say they were dead. You said that it's over. The Johnnies are not making the NCAA tournament or something along those lines. See, I did say that. I did say St. John's won't be making the NCAA tournament. I might have put in barring a miracle, but I don't even know if I, if I went that far. I'm going to stand by that. I still think you know, he's going to be coaching the NIT. And if he proves me wrong, hey, guess what? That means I get an awesome story to cover in person at the Big East tournament, and I'm absolutely all for that. And I'm glad we're starting here. One, because for our audience, yeah, we'll get to the thing that people were talking about. But let's not fatigue you and overwhelm you with all the court you know, storming discourse there. So let's talk Johnny's here. Uh, Dennis Jenkins had a season high, 27 points, six assists, two blocks, two steals. And he was awesome. This was the a reminder, the second quad one win for St. John's as we talked about this, as we talk about them, you know, getting back into the tournament discussion, they're two and nine in quad one. So much, much work to do, but a nice, a nice win, a big East low three turnovers in this game. Uh, they had 24 assists. That was the obvious thing when you, when you watch this game on CBS and hopefully you caught GP working out of the Fort Lauderdale studio on HQ. St. John's ball movement was incredible. They were on it and they looked ready to go from the start. Um, extremely, extremely impressive, man. 18 points off of Creighton's turnovers. And uh, you know, the fact that they didn't turn over a ton is also a testament to the fact that, uh, Lapis even said this, referencing the Ken Palm stat. Uh, Creighton's dead last in the country at forcing turnovers, so they uh, they were lined up to have a good game there, and they didn't miss a foul shot either. 10 from 10 from the foul line, and a seven-game losing streak, GP, against the Blue Jays is now done. Uh, your thoughts on, on you know, at least one St. John's uh, keeping it interesting and in a in an interesting mix of, of Big East teams right, you know, near the cut line or, or in the vicinity, and... You know, we have this continuation now where we're getting uh, Big East teams with high-profile wins and then having the letdown game right after. And Pac-12 teams, too. Hey, Washington State. That's right. How you, do how you doing? How you doing, Washington uh, State? That's true. But, but, yeah, Creighton, you know, they, they blast UConn middle of the week and then get – not blasted, but they did lose by 14 uh, at St. John's. That's a story, but that's mostly an Omaha story. That's mostly a Creighton message board story. I don't think we learned anything good or bad about Creighton today. I don't think Creighton is as good as it looked against UConn middle of the week. And I don't think Creighton is the type of team that lose to St. John's by 14 points too often. Uh, so, like, take that. Let's set it aside. The real story is, I think, St. John's. Uh, winning a, a big nationally televised game inside the Garden. Rick Pitino coming out in the white suit. And keeping their – keeping – I do believe their at-large hopes are still alive. Now, that means they got to be basically perfect the rest of the way. But I do think you can – and perhaps I'd, I'd like to hear Jerry Palm's take on this. But I, I think you can say right now, you're right. There is no self-respecting bracketologist who would have St. John's in the bracket tonight, even after what happened earlier today. When you look at CBSSports.com, Jerry Palm's updated bracket, and I should make sure everybody knows this, um, Jerry's updating his bracket every single morning. Wow. Now. We saw you coming for his job. Top 25 and one. 
So we had no choice. Yeah, no choice. You got to hey, you, you got to keep up, or I'll take that too. But what's interesting about this is there are there's some spots there where you and good where old uh, Gary Palm and Jerry Parrish they <laughs> might have uh, some notable discrepancies between some teams. So I'm liking uh, seeing that. Oh yeah, um, but I would be interested to get his thoughts on it. Um, I I believe the way if I'm looking at it, I believe that St. John's has a path to an at-large bid, and the way I reached this conclusion, and I think this is in uh, instructive, sometimes helpful, because depending on what bracketologist you look at, you know they're all going to have a last four in and a first four out, and some of them will have a next four out. Maybe somewhere you know if you can find it, there's a next four out. But it gets to a point where if you are St. John's and you're no longer in the field, projected field, and you're no longer first four out and you're no longer next four out, it, 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 fans sit around going like, where are we? All right, like, are we close? Do it like, I don't know where we're at. When you tell us we're first four out, that makes perfect. I know where we're at. But right now we ain't first four out, we ain't next four out. I don't know where we're at. So what I find is helpful sometimes is to go look at the last team Jerry Palm has in his bracket and then look at that resume, that body of work, and then go, okay, now how does this team's body of work compare to that? Maybe we can see where they're at. So follow me here. I'm going to bore you with some numbers real quick, but I do think they're important to sort of frame this con uh, conversation. Wake Forest. Congrats to them. We'll get to them. They won a big game this weekend. They are now the last team in Jerry Palm's field. Wake Forest right now is one and four in quadrant one, five and five in quadrant two. So six and nine in the first two quadrants with no additional losses in quadrant three or four. Wake has one quadrant one win. Hold that. I'll bring you back to it in a second. Meantime, St. John's is now two and nine in quadrant one, six and two in quadrant two. So eight and 11 in the first two quadrants. They do have a quadrant three loss. It's to Michigan more than three months ago. St. John's has two quadrant one wins. Now, let me be clear. You cannot um, appropriately compare resumes by doing merely what I did. There are lots of other things that matter. But on a very basic level, I just showed you that St. John's doesn't appear to be that far away from Wake Forest. Both teams are three games below 500 in the first two quadrants. Wake has better computer numbers, but St. John's um, has more quadrant one wins and only three losses outside of quadrant one, although one of them is in quadrant three. Wake's got five losses outside of quadrant one, but all of them are in quadrant two, which means none of them are in Q3 or Q4. I'm not saying St. John's is going to get there. I'm just saying, based on what I just told you, I can see a path. And it starts with another quadrant one opportunity at Butler on Wednesday. You'll win that one. You're only two games below 500 in the first two quadrants. And then they close the regular season at DePaul at Georgetown. Those can only hurt you. They can't help you. But assuming they win both of those, and if they can win at Butler, they enter the Big East tournament with computer numbers probably in the 40s or the 30s and only two games below 500 in the first two quadrants based on current net rankings. And that would give them a chance in their home building to maybe do enough in the Big East tournament to, if they can't win it, get an at-large bid. I think it's possible. Probable? I'd say not probable, but possible. Let them get a couple more wins. If they do, we'll circle back. Um, get more into this with Wake after the break. Um, and wins above bubble. St. John's is still below Wake Forest, which is below South Florida, with Jerry Palma said doesn't really have any case to an at-large path. I actually would disagree with that. If it wins out to the American Championship semis or better, let's circle back around. But Wake is even below South Florida right now, wins above bubble, and in strength of record, which needs to refresh on Monday morning. Uh, Wake is 45 right now. St. John's entering the day was 68. It won't jump Wake in strength of record. That's more resume-based. Obviously, it's not predictive in nature. Keep that in mind. But yes, GP, there's a, there's a chance. Um, John Fanta, our bud, he interviewed. So Patino gets the white suit and Fanta actually got the story here. This is about a 45 second clip. Not has got it locked and loaded, I believe, because Patino donning the white suit and what was a whiteout for St. John's noon tip. Uh, it was a throwback to when he did this uh, practically annually at Louisville. Uh, but it turns out that he had been kind of asked to do this for a bit and he was not going to do it. And then something changed on Saturday. Not to fire this up. Here's what he told John Fanta about donning all you show up to your press conference in all black. It was the opposite to start this afternoon an all white suit that set this building on fire. But it wasn't always going to be that way. Give us the story. Well, my wife kept saying, and my kids said, you got to wait a way. I said, that's Kentucky, guys. Um, they said, no, no, you have to do it. The players will absolutely love it. So I w uh, until 2 o'clock yesterday, I wasn't doing it. I called up Armani. I said, that white jacket you told me about, you have it? Yep. I said, white pants, white shoes. I said, let's go. Let's do it. I said, you tell it. When I got there, tell us, I can't. 
can't shorten the sleeves and do it. In, uh, I'm off in three hours. Uh, I sweetened the pot a little bit, and he did it. Okay. <laughs> Sweeten the pot. That's all you got right, to do. Right there's, to there's, a, there's a real lesson in there. Sweeten the pot. <laughs> Yeah, Sweet if, if can get a lot of things done. Is, if you're extremely rich, you can get things done. That's the lesson. So yes. let's let's just uh, harmlessly speculate because I, I love the story here. First of all, it's like I I called up Armani. <laughs> of course, he did. Rick, <laughs> how much did he pay the tailor to get it done after he said I got three hours and I can't? And, and, and the tailor's probably, ah, uh, Rick, what do you want me to do? I'm off in three hours. I just there's no way to make it happen. And then Rick's kind of like, oh, you really? I'm gonna say I'm gonna say he paid him an extra thousand dollars to uh, to tailor that. That's my guess. I, I don't know if we'll ever get the answer, but yeah, why not? Just to, just to be true to my what I was actually going to say before you said what you said, I was going to say five hundred. Yeah, minimum, minimum five hundred, minimum. Because you think like you got he's got to at least dedicate another hour or two minimum. So you've got five hundred. I've got a thousand. Uh, you are an extortion expert, and no, this wasn't extortion. It was just purely purely bribery. I figured you'd have the inside angle on that. But I love the GP. I love the idea that he wasn't going to do it. He calls up Arma <laughs> Armani. <laughs> And uh, and the store gets it done, and he wear, he he wears it now. I don't want this to be a one and done. Now maybe he might be a bit superstitious and not want, but he has lost in the white suit previously at Louisville. If I'm him, I don't wear it again until the first round of the Big East tournament. And then if you win there, you win it every single time until until. That's what I would do if I was him. I want to see the white suit again before the season's over. That would be great to wear it in the Big East tournament, have it become a thing of championship yes. week, which it obviously would. And you know what you would get? Fans showing up in white suits at the Garden. <laughs> It'd be terrific. It It'd would be the be, best. It'd be amazing, yeah. I was at a white suit game at Louisville. I be, if I, I, I think it was against Marquette. This is all just off the top of my head. I think, I think it was against Marquette. I believe it was a Sunday afternoon. I remember being in an Irish bar later that night with Pete Thamel and Steve Mazziello and Wes Welker's future wife. Okay. Don't know who that is. You don't know Wes Welker? I know Wes Welker. I don't know who his future wife is or what. Well, you should Google her. Google her. Buddy, she she takes some good pictures back in the day. I'm sure she does and did. Okay. I mean, I don't know what her pictures look like these days, but they were good back then. (laughs) I ain't seen no pictures lately. I ain't been Googling lately. I don't Google. I don't. Are going somewhere else? Nope. No, okay. I just wanted I just I just wanted to acknowledge that I've been to a white suit game and it ended with a okay. terrible terrible headache okay. and a really bad headache. <laughs> well, uh well there we go. Uh, you want to uh you want to get to the thing that, you know, people undoubtedly I'm sure are checking in on this podcast for that went down on Saturday. Dude, are you kidding? It's my it's my favorite thing to talk about. Did I just leave the podcast for like 15 minutes? <laughs> all right. All right. Norlander is going to go take a a a, a coffee break. And I'm going to rant for about 20 minutes about, about why court storming are the worst thing in the history of the planet. We'll do that next. But first, a word from our partners. We need the sports news anywhere. We've got breaking news to bring you. Then get your sports anytime you want them. Big trade news overnight to discuss. Because we know you need sports all the time. A lot of movement in the rankings this week. A legend adds to their legacy. We're bringing you that breaking news right here on HQ. CBS Sports HQ anywhere, anytime, all the time. Oh, you might have heard. Court storming is back in the news because of how Duke star Kyle Filipowski got caught up in one after this weekend's loss at Wake Forest. Because before, it looks like I'm just going to be discussing it. Dead leg's gone. Before I discuss it in great detail, can we watch it, Nada? You know, I forgot, to, I forgot to load that one up. I apologize. Oh. Oh, wow. Okay, well, uh, never mind on that. Uh, You know what? You guys can Google it yourself, Twitter search it yourself. You know what it looks like, probably, if you care. So, it's a big game at Wake Forest. Wake on the wrong side of the bubble. Steve Forbes had just called out Joe Lenardi earlier in the week, told him to stay in his lane. He's fed up with bracketology. He's fed up with the net. He's fed up with uh, all of this stuff. People not properly respecting his team. So, they end up, big home game with Duke. They win it. And I was going to say right at the buzzer, but technically it was even before the buzzer. You have a group of students, let's call it several dozen, certainly could have been a hundred by the end of it, who knows, but a lot of people, several dozen running full speed onto the court. Duke players and Wake players are still on it. Cal Filipowski right in the middle of it ends up limping off the court, says afterward that he does have a uh, knee injury, and even implied that it was intentional and personal what these Wake St- Forest students uh, 
did to him. I can't speak to that. I can't get in front of uh, inside anybody's head. I, 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 my instincts are to say Wake Forest fans weren't running out there to hit Kyle Filipowski as much as they were running out there. But whatever. I, I can't argue with what he believes. Uh, Dead leg. I know you got your guitar, and I know you don't care about these things much. But just before I get going, what do you think of what happened between uh, after the game uh, when Wake Forest beat Duke? And then the our latest court storm actually resulted in something that's uh, not ideal. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, this is a major story, so we're obviously gonna we're gonna give it its due here on the pod. Um, yes, and I know that there's because we've talked about this almost like almost annually for a decade plus on the on the show. Uh, I'm going to invoke uh, something that you said on HQ yesterday. Um, I actually looked for this column. I know I wrote it. It's just, it's in our old blog system. You cannot find it. It's not on the internet way back machine, but 11 years ago on March one. So upcoming, we're almost 11 years to the day. So a year before you were, you wrote yours. Um, I basically wrote a column that said, if you want to eliminate court storming, you can try probably won't happen because if you do it, and even if it goes away for a year or two, It'll come back one day. It just will. These are college kids, and you're not going to build a moat around the the hardwood. I don't find it to be ultra realistic that you you can ever ever permanently remove it from the game. I'm not opposed to if you want to try and do it. I just don't think uh, realistically that's something that will hold long term. However, if you can get the culture in the sport through flyers you put down on every single uh, student section seat before the game, through multiple public address announcements after the game, through things on the video scoreboard, everything. If anything, maybe it even adds to a weird home court advantage where you keep talking and reminding the student fan base, hey, if we win this game, we, we want you to storm the floor. You cannot do it at triple zeros. Here's what we want you to do. And what I suggested 11 years ago was, one, obviously you have to have enough security to do all this, but get the other team off the floor as soon as possible. And then an even, maybe even even cooler visual would be, and there was actually a small, a small major did this within like the ensuing year. Cause I remember, cause we blogged about it. I just can't remember who did it. You get the entire team out on the center court logo. Okay. And then, uh, in fact, Rob Doster, uh, had said, uh, on Saturday that he had a coach text him, text him this idea. You, you count down the shot clock again. So every, or the main scoreboard, whatever, count it down from 20. The, the other team is now well in the tunnel. And then all everyone, it's if anything, it might be more organized because everyone has a chance to get themselves in order. And then they all run out and they surround the team. Everyone's jumping and the players are waiting for everyone to smother them in joy and happiness. That's what I would like to see try and implement it. It is a potential solution to this. Um, it did happen again. I just can't remember the school. I was looking. Trust me, I was looking on Saturday night while I was on the H HQ desk. What happened on Saturday was a complete failure. You saw the ACC come out with a statement, although it didn't say much, to be honest, from ACC Commissioner Jim Phillips. You saw the AD say, we did prepare for this. Obviously, we failed. Undoubtedly, you failed on that event. You can't have players on the floor before it ends. Uh, I have zero interest in the Filipowski had it coming. Of course, he didn't. They're not allowed to be on the court. He had a mob coming at him. He was the Jon Snow meme with the army coming at him, okay? <laughs> so I don't, I, I really am not here for even one second of that whatsoever. Hopefully, he is okay. And uh, that is my my solution. I know you want to ban it outright. I'm not even objecting to that. Uh, I think it is more realistic that you could try through serious means of still uh, allowing the mob mentality of college students in a frenzied moment to say, okay, if we get a chance, here's how we do it, than to say this is banned. Because even if you got to a situ situation, GP, where it got banned, wouldn't you agree that you could easily see like, OK, we haven't had a court storm in two years and oh, but look at this, you know, Team X upsets top five team. And well, it's been three years since we see. I just feel like it would eventually come back and you might be, you know, dealing with this kind of situation down the road. So in absence of that, why not have a specific protocol in place that, oh, by the way, I think would make for a pretty cool visual overall. And now the floor is entirely yours. Okay, let me say a few things first. Um, I did talk to Wake Forest coach Steve Forbes earlier today. His, I, he hates court stormings, by the way. He does not like them. He says he's been in them and it feels uncomfortable and he didn't like what happened on Saturday. His um, suggestion is similar to what you just said. Hey, hey, why can't we continue to let students celebrate with players on the floor after big wins or upsets or whatever, but 
let's also control it a little more. In other words, we're not going at the buzzer or even before the buzzer, obviously. Um, we're going to get through the handshake lines and we're going to get the other team off the court. And there's going to be a countdown clock up there, almost like a red light and green light type of thing. And it's like, okay, guys, green light, let's go. But no squid game, just so we're clear. <laughs> no, no. What Forbes said was then if you go at the wrong time, you get immediately shot. Okay. <laughs> that was his suggestion. Okay. Steve Forbes did not suggest anybody get shot. We're having fun. His suggestion was something along those lines. Um, hey, let's get the other team off the court. And then there, there's a there's a clear signal to everybody. Let's go. It's time to go. It's okay to go. If you go before that, you're in trouble. But if you go after that, let's have a good time. That's his um, compromise slash solution. I'm fine with it. I, I'm not going to sit here and scream about it. I just um, I don't know why we have to compromise on this. We don't have to compromise anywhere else. And I'm not trying to argue with you, but you you made the, the statement like we, we can't build a moat around the court. It doesn't take a moat. It just takes rules we do, and, and rules that are enforced. We don't have a moat around NBA courts. We don't have a moat around NFL films. We don't have a moat around NFL, uh, NHL hockey rinks, although that would probably be cool if we did do that. We don't have a moat, um, you know, uh, around the pitch, as Good, they say. I agree, but those are different clienteles than who is closest to those playing surfaces at a college arena. That's all. And, you know, you have them at football games in college. You know, I don't care how old these people are. You, you, we have laws in this country, and it, they, it, nobody says, "Well, if you're 19, you know, we'll let you drink and drive." But if you're 30, hey, you know, we can't do that. We no, we, we don't say, "Hey, it's just college kids. What are you going to do?" Well, no, you can't do this. You can't do this. Period. And that's where I'm at on it. The, I, I don't understand people trying to rationalize this or people trying to act like it's okay. And I, this is not going to come across the right way. I know it before I even say it. I don't mean it the way it sounds, but I do mean it. I just don't mean it the way it sounds, but I 100% mean it. I have not seen a person I'm impressed by actually make an argument that says we should continue to allow court stormings, however they happen, the way we always have. There are people who do say that. I'm just telling you, I've never been impressed by somebody who says that. I never, there are certain times people disagree with me and I'll, and I'll read them and I go, hmm, that's a smart person. That's somebody I respect. That's somebody who I usually agree with and I disagree with them on this. Maybe I need to reevaluate this. I'm telling you that has never happened here. Not one time. Have I ever seen somebody go, GP, I think we should keep allowing court stormings as always. And I go, well, that's a smart person. It never seems like one unless it's a smart person who has other motives and they're catering to a certain audience. We have entire cable networks built around that. It also exists in social media. Uh, but like I just take those people, push it aside. There is, I want to be clear, no sensible argument to allow this to continue to happen. None whatsoever. I know it's fun. I guess that's what they tell me. But and I know it, it looks good on TV. Trust me, I work for a network that has shown them a million times. Yeah. All right. I know they look good and people tell me they're fun. I'll take their word for it. But your um, ability to have fun, I've said this a million times, should stop at the point where you're putting other people in danger. You're putting people at risk. And Cal Filipowski was at risk and all those Duke players were at risk on Saturday. And just so it's clear that I'm not just saying this because it was Cal Filipowski and Duke, I wrote the same column nine years ago when it was Kansas and Kansas State. In fact, somebody got in my mentions and said, I wish there was somebody who had the same energy uh, back when it was Kansas, Kansas State. And I'm like, buddy, here's the column from that morning. I did have the same energy. My energy has been consistent on this forever. We are very close legally to getting to a place where student athletes, basketball players are considered employees of universities. You realize we're going to get there someday, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay. So for the sake of this conversation, let's just say we should already be there. Let's just say that what Cal Filipowski amounts to and all those Duke players are employees of Duke University. That means, follow me here, they were at work. They're working. They're doing their job on Saturday. And immediately when they got done doing their job, 100 people ran directly at him full speed. That's crazy. Imagine if tonight I said, um, you know, uh, there's more of us than there are of them. That needs to be reflected in the comments. So make sure you're doing that. And uh, we'll talk to you again on Wednesday. Till then, take care. And immediately, 100 people ran right at me. That's that would crazy. be incredible podcasting, actually. <laughs> it actually <laughs> would. happen. But that's crazy. That's bananas. And that's what we're doing to college basketball players. We don't do it to professional basketball players. We don't do it to professional football players. We don't do it to athletes at any sort of level um, who uh, above this level. 
But for some reason, it's just accepted behavior in college. And oh, by the way, to your point about some people trying to blame Cal Filipowski for this, like, well, <laughs> well, you know, he shoved him or, you know, he initiated the contact. Do you know, I actually asked Steve Forbes about this. Wake Forest fans, if you're somebody who has tweeted that, just know that I asked your coach about people blaming Cal Filipowski about this. And do you know what he told me? F that. Yeah. He said, when you are, when you have, you have no idea how you would react when a hundred people are, and I'm paraphrasing here, but this is the point he was making. You have no idea how you're going to react when that many people are running at you full speed. And it's, it's fight or flight. You like, you don't know what's going on or how to get out of this. So anybody blaming Cal Filipowski is outrageous. He, he, he was in a w weird situation to be in. I don't know the severity of the injury. I guess we'll see Duke's yeah. next game, but the fact, but but whether he's seriously injured or not at all, should not have anything to do with this conversation. What should, we should all be able to agree on is that he could have got hurt, seriously. And the idea that we would be putting not just all American basketball players, but potential first round draft picks, guys who have millions of dollars to make, the idea that we would be putting them at risk by letting people just run onto the court where they do not belong is absolutely asinine and hopefully this is the thing hopefully hopefully this is the thing that leads to um us doing something to actually change it because uh until we change it this is going to keep happening and we'll have to keep spending minutes on the podcast on it i am skeptical it is the thing now uh, i'm pretty sure on an episode six seven years ago we said the one thing that would change this is if a duke player got hurt in a court storm now we have had a duke player get hurt i'm not actually now that we've arrived at this moment I'm not convinced that will be the case. The ACC has no punishment. The schools decide on this stuff. Um, so I would presume in the offseason, the ACC will be, I think it's the last one. I saw ESPN a graphic up um, on Saturday. It might be the only high major league that doesn't have any kind of punishment. Financial punishments aren't going to dissuade this from happening. You have had oh. <laughs> this. It's even more for football. And like the schools turn it into social media promotional things when they, when kids rush onto the field. Um, so I don't think that's going to slow it down. Uh, I, I'm not a listen. I personally, I don't need court storming. I don't. Um, actually, stopping it if it happens, I'll be. I will. I will genuinely be impressed, and I won't push back if it stop. If it stops, I think there is a potential workaround to still have a, a a memorable moment with your student body and the players. Because you know, I, you know, I st I still think that the, the the home team and the players. You're, not, you're the home team. So it's it's a really cool thing for you to experience as someone that uh, plays on a college basketball team. Visiting team, you want nothing to do with it. John Shire has also lived with this forever because he was an assistant forever at Duke. And they got they got court storm like once every three times they lost on the road for like 15 years. So you get so sick of it. Painters talked about it this year, et cetera. I will, for transparency's sake, go ahead, GP. In our Google Doc, <laughs> it did say let's briefly talk about this. So go ahead. But uh, we can move on whenever you are ready. I'm not good at briefly talking about anything. All right. That's not my strong point. And, I, and I, as a side note, Wake Forest is in the court report. I am due to talk to Steve Forbes in about 30 minutes, but uh, but we'll see how that goes. Okay, I'll say one last thing, and then we'll move on. Okay. There's a lot of – you because this is the thing. How would you even stop it? That's what people say. Um, well, you, I agree with you. You can't stop it by finding a school. <laughs> there, there ain't no student uh, in a student section anywhere who cares about their school making a hundred thousand, having to pay a hundred thousand dollars. You know what them Wake Forest students are saying? Well, I had to give these bastards eighty grand, <laughs> <laughs> or more likely, my you parents be paying me to rush the floor. That's what should <laughs> yes. be happening. Yeah, so they don't care, right? That, every Wake Forest student is like, I basically covered that myself. All right, I, I, I basically covered that myself this year. So the money thing will never work. That's just. That's just. I, I guess it's to trivia, sound. Hold on. Wake Forest trivia time, out of state tuition. I'm going to Google right now. Oh, my you know, my oldest son looked at going there. It's okay. not and cheap. It was, like it was 62, 128. All right, there we go. 62, I, 128. Woo. I, was, I was like, man, Forrest, before that thing happened at USC with all those uh, ki uh, celebrities getting their kids in school, I'd have maybe tried to call in a favor from you, but I ain't going to get you in that spot now. <laughs> so uh, my, my son did not go to Wake Forest, but we, we looked at it. I remember it being not cheap. Not as cheap as in-state tuition in Mississippi. <laughs> so uh, here's what you do. It's not a money thing, and it's not overwhelm it with security because they had security at the game. They did nothing, best I could tell. So, so, <laughs> I know, man. That's all right. 
<laughs> so I don't, I don't know. I don't know what security does because they. I, I'm assuming they Dude, had security there. You know, and I, aside on this, keep with your thought. But I was at the Duke Arkansas game earlier this season, and I tweeted the video of the of the students rushing the floor, and it's hilarious because the PA announcer goes, "When the game is over, please don't rush the floor," and like everyone <laughs> laughed, and then they did it anyway. Like, and the security no. did nothing. So continue. If if security tried to stop the Wake Forest students from being on the court, then every Wake Forest student is Aaron Donald <laughs> because they got where they were trying to get to and they got there fast. Wake Forest got a whole student section of Aaron Donald's if the security was trying to keep them out. So it's not security and it's not money. You know what it is? It is clear rules and clear punishment. No exceptions. This is all you have to do at every school in America. Whenever you're ready to do it, this is it. Hey guys, you're not allowed on the floor at all. Not before the game, not during the game, not after the game. If you are a student and you get on the floor, and this is extreme, I get it, and you, we could dial this back a little bit, but just for the sake of the conversation, let's go extreme. You come on that floor after a game, I don't care what your reason is, you're dismissed from school. You're expelled. It's over. $62,000 down the drain. All right? I'm sure somebody will test it. Let them test it. Expel them all. It'll, it will not be tested again. And if it ever is tested, uh, tested again, expel them all. You know, this is our second most popular storming in America. The other one's capital storming. Well, what did we do there? We said, you can't do that. Now you got to go to jail. Well, all right. And how many went to jail? I think I think a pretty good bit. Not all of them. But like, I, than, you think it was more than one percent? I don't know about that. I, I don't know. We got who we could get. All right. Yeah. And we, yeah. We, we got who we could get. Paris, so, again, Paris comes back to the plan where he wants to arrest, you know, 747 people. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm fine with it. I, I'm t All I'm telling you is we don't have to overwhelm security at uh, Kroger to make sure everybody's not running out of there with hamburger meat. All right. You just tell people you can't run out of here with hamburger meat without paying for it. And if you do, we're going to arrest you and you're going to have to deal with that. Same thing here. Just tell people you can't do this. And if you do it, this is what's going to happen to you. And they'll stop doing it. That's as easy. It's not complicated. I don't know why people make it out to be. This was the first sellout of the Joel since 2017. Wake Forest wins 83-79 before all that. And you know what? Credit to John Shire for this because he did say in his post-game uh, statement, we're not going to play on the pod because you've heard it. If you're listening, you've heard it. We're not going to We're not going to take up more time with this. But he said, I don't want this to take away from what Wake Forest did. And he's right. Wake Forest right now, it's 15-0 and on its home floor, man. And I mentioned this on the Friday pod. Like, it hasn't been this good at home since Chris Paul was playing there almost 20 years ago. Um, they, they ended a streak of six straight losses against AP-ranked opponents. Hunter Salas continues to be just something else, man. He had 29 points in this game. Uh, it was the most by any player against Duke so far this season. He's averaging 18.7 points, four rebounds, two and a half assists. 43.5% from beyond the arc. Um, I'll talk about Salas with Forbes, and that'll be in the court report because I'm uh, really intrigued to see, um, you know, Forbes' latest transfer to come in and him just unlocking something. You know, Salas was an identified talent, went into Gonzaga, but he's a completely different player there. Uh, so, so impressive. Duke gave, and uh, in terms of the gameplay, like Duke had four turnovers in the final minute 40, including the one where Filipowski didn't see it coming. That like Duke didn't even get the shot off and Wake was on fire. 1.36 points per possession. It was it was absurd, man. Um so it, Wake gets a good win, but and I would have Wake in the field right now, but it has more work to do. And this maybe this will be the win that really gets them on the track to get it done. But there are still there's still stuff on the resume that they're far from a lock, obviously. I mean, beyond that, they, they they need to turn around this week and make sure they don't they don't drop a game. Meantime, if I can fold in the other ACC result tied to all this, by nature of Duke losing GP, Carolina went on the road and won at Virginia, 54-44. Virginia can't crack 50 anymore, okay? And Carolina now is a game up in the ACC standings. And so now, if it does what it's supposed to do, and even if it were to lose against Duke, it would have a share of the ACC regular season championship, which, uh, which which is a big deal for, for UNC. Virginia's just narrowly dodging the Dayton um, portion of the bracket at this point, but it's it's going the wrong way. Uh, it was 5 of 30 from the field in the first half in that game. It was a, it was an ugly game in UNC. I know Tar Heel fans know this, but you're, if you're unfamiliar, it got mentioned a number of times in the broadcast. Hadn't won at Virginia in 12 years. So they win uh, for, what, the first time in nine tries there. They finally get a win. And Cormac Ryan has been tremendous as of late. He had 18 points in the game, GP, and uh, he is 16 of 32, 50% from beyond the arc uh, in his last four games, averaging 15 points in that stretch. Extremely impressive from UNC to go on the road and just 
not allow Virginia to get out of its funk. So uh, in terms of on-court stuff or any other takeaways from Wake Duke and UNC UVA, what do you got for me? Well, Wake Duke, just you said it accurately about Hunter Salas. He's been unlocked. Um, and I, I think I said this before, but this is the best example people are among the best examples people should hold up when other coaches try to talk about the transfer portal and the one-time transfer waivers and the six-time transfer waivers have led to young people not learning how to fight through adversity and young people um, running from adversity. Well, Hunter Salas was at Gonzaga for two years after being a McDonald's All-American. He barely played. He never even averaged five points per game. You only get, I know we're in the COVID stuff, so maybe five years, but in normal times, four years to do this. Four seasons of college basketball. Who wants to spend them sitting on the bench? So Hunter Salas, super talented guy, clearly, decides, you know what? I don't want to just keep sitting on the bench, wasting my college career. Let me go try something else somewhere else. And now he's averaging 18.7 points at Wake, shooting 43.5% from three. Obviously, I talked to Forbes today that Hunter Salas comes up. He says he just was lacking confidence when he got here, you know, because you would if you're a McDonald's All-American and you've just been on the bench for two years. You want to write the court report at this point? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I feel like I feel like this is when I just randomly brought up Miles Rice and I saw your face sink. No, no, no. We're good. We're good. We're good. Um, it, no, I think Forbes, frankly, called out uh, called out some other media folks. So he's I think he's all he's all like Team CBS at this point. And, you know, I'm just I'm just talking about it. Um, so. Hunter Salas, like he wasn't running from adversity. He was running for the chance to have a better college career and he's having it. And now he's the latest, maybe one and done wake transfer. I mean, I mean, yeah. who's better, who's better at taking a transfer and you're like, Oh, I guess that'll be fine. And then it just, boom, he's averaging 20 points a game. Hunter Salas, Tyree Appleby, Alondis Williams, Jake LaRavia. That's like just I in the past. Literally few years. just write my court report. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's just, this is this is literally what I'm going to write about. So okay, no. enough about Wake. I'm done. I ain't saying the one more. I'm not saying any more words about Wake to Virginia. Well, okay, North Carolina won for the first time in a long time at Virginia. Well, you only need 45 points to win at Virginia these days. That's all it takes. All right. Yeah. I mean, the past three games, it's 49, 41, and 44. Uh, these dudes have been in the 40s, like three straight games. Uh, they're 188th in adjusted offensive efficiency. Like my my, my little guys playing seven year old basketball. He might he his team might get to 40. Like his team might could get to 50 if Lil Lou got hot from the perimeter. So mm-hmm. I don't like I said in recent weeks that you know, Virginia, like Tony is amazing. He's a Hall of Fame coach. Um, but this must be frustrating to watch. I mean, I I I would if I were a fan of a college basketball team and I was watching Alabama Kentucky and then I had to turn that on, I'd be like. This is not fun. Uh, it's wild. And and because it's Virginia, like it's entirely within reason that we look up and it's just in the ACC championship game. And after this dreadful run here, we look and it's won like six out of the past seven. I don't think it's going to happen, but because it's Tony Bennett and it's Virginia, always keep that in mind. We got a lot still to get to. We got a whole whip around. Michigan State got beat up, but we haven't gotten to it yet. So not a... Partner time. Partner me. Let's go. Let's get to it. Come on. Scudetto, where the soul of Italy meets the pinnacle of Calcio. Catch Seria on CBS Sports Network and streaming live on Paramount+. Plus. All right, Norlander, whip us around the rest of the nation. What else we need to know? We'll start. Okay, so let's do uh, let's do three games in particular here. Uh, quick mention, quick chat, and then I'll we'll kind of truly do the uh, the speedy whip around there. Michigan State played with its food and got burnt. Ohio State on Sunday on CBS is <laughs> like wouldn't UCLA at this point? Like, I don't know what, <laughs> dude, I don't know what what is going on. Like, like Deepler, we have a back to back Sunday Deebler situation. Like we, the NFL is over, and Debler has taken over Sundays on CBS. He's the new Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> he absolutely is, and that's why I know you come to this pod, folks. They're sixty to fifty-seven. Ohio State wins, and it wins because of a Dale Bonner three-pointer at the buzzer. Uh, Michigan State just let him linger and linger and linger. Uh, now the Spartans are seventeen and eleven overall, and they are they're still in the field, but. Man, there's just so many. I, for Michigan State fans, this must be as frustrating a season as you've had, period, because preseason top five status brought back plenty on a team that made the second weekend last season, and they opened up the season at home with an OT loss to James Madison, who, by the way, has turned out to be pretty damn good at a mid-major level. But 
you just can't seem to get any kind of consistency here. This is the second loss in a row for Michigan State. It's nine and eight in the Big Ten. Yes, its tournament outlook is still comfortable, but guess what? You, you, this is your bye week. You turn around next week and you play at Purdue. So you are staring down a three-game road losing streak. Then you're home against Northwestern. That's not a gimme. And then you close up against Indiana. Maybe that will be. Who the heck knows? We'll get to the Hoosiers in just a second there. Any thoughts? I don't know if you had, you were in HQ Studios in Fort Lauderdale mm-hmm. on Sunday. I don't know if you were there till the end of this game or not, but to, from what you saw to uh, to wrap up the CBS triple header. I mean, it's just an outrageous shot. <laughs> I mean, I know. Uh, yeah, it, it's curious. not even it's not even like a great look. He, I mean, it's it's like he's it's uncomfortable. It's not a normal shot. And he get you know, he gets it up. You know, you got to get it out of your hand. And he does. And, you know, it goes in and it's it's as simple as that. Um, it, it, if you're Michigan State, if you're Tom, you don't you can live with that shot. What you can't live is putting yourself in a position where that shot could beat you. You could live with that shot. That shot's not going in. If they ran, if they gave him that same shot another nine times, how many times did he make it? Uh, I'm going to say that's a two out of 10 kind of something situation. like, yeah, it's yeah. something like that. You can live with the shot. You just can't live with putting yourself in a position to let something like that happen to you. And I, I agree with you. Michigan State is still safely in the field. Tom Izzo is still almost certainly going to coach in his 26th straight NCAA tournament. That's a record already. But I mentioned earlier, Wake is the last team in the field, according to Jerry Palm, three games under 500 in the first two quadrants. Do you know where Michigan State is? They're now two games under 500 in the first two quadrants. And if they lose to Purdue in their next game, well, then that's three games under 500 in the first two quadrants. Again, all things aren't created equal. They do have three quadrant one wins. Wake only has one. But you start messing around in that two, three, four games under 500 in the first two quadrants range, you know, you, you start to put yourself in a, you know, you start to book tickets to Dayton. You know, feels like and this will clear up. But right now you say that it feels like 14 teams are trying to book a, t- a ticket to Dayton. It's it's wild how many teams either seem to be trending that way, fighting their way into it, or they just keep going back and forth, back and forth. Uh, the MSU Ohio State game was the last game of the weekend on CBS. The first game of the weekend was second rate Houston uh, getting out with a win in OT after Baylor made a really awesome second half push. 82-76. Um, it was the first time these teams met since the national semis when Baylor won that one. Houston gets it done here, and Houston led by 17 points in this game. Baylor cut that lead to nothing. They end up, they wind up going to OT after Eves Meese makes a nice play down low, and he can't hit the foul shot. And then Jamal Shedd hits the hits the another buzzer beater, but wasn't out of his hand just in time there. And had they should have they should have let they should have let Bonner take it. Well, that's the the problem is he plays for a different. Team and yeah, Damn, I, that I, is I, a problem. That is they should they should they should have been rolled Bonner and let him do it. Yeah, I know. Um, Baylor got turned over eleven times in the first out. I, so we both picked Baylor to cover. We were both wrong. You beat me three, three, two, two, three in the final four and one this weekend. Don't Insurmountable say, is the way you say it. it up. Insurmountable. That's how you say it. Houston. I think this it's not new on the pod here for people that listen, but to me, the fact that you've had UConn take a loss recently, Purdue take a loss recently, this is what gets Houston into the, okay, there's three, I've been saying it, but this is really what is, and I'll probably be number one, I think, in the AP Top 25, whatever. At this point, Purdue, UConn, and Houston are going to have to step way out of character to not have three of the four one seeds, and we are what we could have developing, which could be pretty exciting, is which team actually winds up getting the number one overall seed because uh, if Purdue gets it, it'll want to go to Detroit. And these schools might wind up going there anyway. We'll see how that fourth one shakes out. But Houston will want it so it can be going to Dallas. Uh, Remember, if you're the number one overall seed, that's the only school that gets to pick its path if it were to make the Final Four where it wants to go. And then UConn would be Brooklyn. And then Boston is the regional there. So keep that in mind. I will give a shout-out in this game, GP, to Jacoby Walter. He dropped 23 Um that was the most, uh, we mentioned Salah scored more than anyone uh, on Duke this season. Walters, 23, were the most by any player against Houston. Uh, Baylor is now 1-18 and all-time against top two teams. It's only win ever against the top two team. Trivia time. Mm. Only win ever against the top two team. When did that happen? When did Baylor beat a top two team for the first time ever? First and only time. It's only happened once. Oh, yeah, that was, um. oh, 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 you ready? Oh, I think I got it. Gonzaga. Correct. And Zag in the title game is the only time Baylor has ever beaten a top two team. Uh, quick thoughts on Houston Baylor. Eve, Eve Misi is great. He's going to be a first round pick. He's having a nice season. Oh, buddy. He screwed that up at the end. He not only did he miss the free throw. I know. I know. 
then he like caught a ball underneath the rim. Yeah. Like you just have to, you just have to do that with it. Gaps. I know. Yeah. And he let it go. He just lost it. And then what was it? The offensive basket interference mm-hmm. on, mm-hmm. on, yeah, that on like was going in too. Yeah. And, and I think that was a Jacoby Walter shot. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So it's just a little, ugh. I mean, I felt sick for him cause you know, that's eating him up. He's, um, you know, he had a chance to end it, maybe not end it. Well, you know, because Chet could have come down and got it off a little bit earlier, but he had a shot to probably end it and didn't. And then in overtime that didn't cost him the game, but it, it certainly, uh, didn't help. I do believe that Houston will be number one in the AP poll on Monday. Um, there there's, it's easy to do. Uh, they're number two in the AP poll. UConn lost midweek. Houston went and picked up a massive win on the road at Baylor. They're number one in most of the computers, including the net. Fine with me. I don't. I, I promise you I'm not going to write a column or open a podcast or even tweet about the stupidity of Houston being ranked number one in the AP poll because I don't think it's stupid. They're, they're obviously one of the three best teams in the country, and they have a comparable resume to the other two best teams in the country. That's Purdue and UConn. And you're exactly right. Those three have separated from the rest of the sport. I mean, we can keep talking about number four, the fourth number one seed. And that's going to be a story that like, that'll be a thing that picks up. Is it Tennessee? Is it uh, Iowa state? Is Is it North Carolina? Is it Arizona? We can keep having it, but ain't nobody cracking that top three anytime soon. It doesn't look like, um, but, it is clear to me still that Purdue has the best resume in the country. And I will still have Purdue number one on Monday morning. Uh, not because I love Zach Eady, not because I love Matt Painter, but I do. I do both of those things. But because Purdue has more good wins than anybody, and they have um, the best wins of anybody. They have seven top 25 wins over net teams. Uh, I think UConn's got certainly less than that. I believe it's either four or five. Houston less than that as well. Uh, Produced 17 and three now in the first two quadrants. Nobody can match that. Um, they have nine quadrant one wins. So does UConn, but nobody has more. Um, Purdue would still be the number one C overall seed in the NCAA tournament tomorrow morning. Jerry Palm agrees with me. Joe Lenardi agrees with me. Um, Houston is a totally fine number one. Just reference the computer numbers and say, I just believe they're the best. And I can't argue with you. But if we are actually trying to identify the team with the best resume on February 25th, February 26th, it's still Purdue. Purdue got another, like what felt like the 30th, uh, 30-10 game from ED, and they won against Michigan on Sunday. Uh, not a ton to take away from that. So goes. Uh, Kentucky, Alabama, let's make this our last kind of standalone discussion game, and then we'll whip around the other results. Uh, UK, you know what? Kentucky scored 117, and if it really wanted to, it could have gotten to 125 and set uh, and set an all-time SEC record. And it's not even the most they've scored in a, in a game this season. They put up 118 against Marshall, I believe. Um, but it was the most points ever against an AP-ranked opponent in program history. It never dropped 170. 170 is a hell of a lot of points in a 40-minute game. Had never gotten that to that much against a ranked opponent, and uh, and had never scored that much, obviously, against Alabama either. Um, the big takeaway from well, two takeaways, I guess. Uh, Alabama, to me, I said this on HQ uh, in the studio on Saturday. I, I, and the, for the similar reasons with Kentucky, frankly, um, and Nate Oates even admitted afterward, he's like, at this point, our reputation's out there. We just don't guard. Uh, and he's right. I, the, Alabama has such uh, incredible offensive potential. It's the number one rated offense in the sport by both points per possession and overall just traditional points per game. Uh, I, I probably will not be able to talk myself into Alabama winning four in the tournament. There's just not enough resistance defensively. And while matchups matter, so if Alabama actually landed in the right kind of bracket with the right kind of opponents where it could simply win a race to 94 times, it can get there. I just don't think that I'm going to allow myself to do it. And this kind of game re- emphasized that for me, even though it was in a road environment and they won't play on the road in the tournament. The other one is obviously, obviously Justin Edwards having 28 points, not missing a shot, 10 of 10 from the field, four of four from three point range. Um, it was the most made field goals. This is courtesy of our CBS Sports Research folks. This is a good stat. No one ever under Calipari had made as many field goals in a game without a miss as Justin Edwards and his 10 for 10 performance uh, on Saturday. I thought that was an important development for Kentucky. Again, see, it's got a couple things here. Last week, it goes against Auburn. On the road, holds Auburn under 60. Most impressive win of the, of the season to date at that point and defensive showing, right? And then, yes, the LSU game happens, kind of weird ending, whatever. And it's a loss, don't get me wrong. But here, they follow that up one week later with 
a more impressive performance overall, even if like Bama got to 95, but there was, uh, that was a 117. This is going to sound crazy. That was a 117 95 game that felt like a 125 to 75. <laughs> it was not close. Like it was a snooze. Um, and uh, you know, I just, I, I was impressed with Kentucky in a week's time, giving us again, different facets about why we should potentially believe that they can find something in March. What were your thoughts? Well, I'll start with Alabama. I, I think I'm with you. It's just hard to see them stringing four wins, at least three of which are going to have to be against good teams because mm-hmm. when they're on, they're on. But when they're not, they they lose. They have a lot of losses. A lot of they have, they, they've lost eight times, all right? Um, they have they have two more losses than anybody else in the top ten at Ken Palm. They're seventh at Ken Palm right now. So they have a lot of losses for a, an elite team, a so-called elite team. And I don't mean that as a shot. I mean, like – they're just, they lost a lot for a team that's supposed to be one of the, according to the predictive metrics, at least one of them, one of the seven best teams in the country. They've lost a lot for that. Um, they are so committed to their style of play, and I love it. I love it. They, you'll never hear me being critical of this, but they are so committed to it that the, if you remember a few years ago, they were really committed to it, but they also had like a top five or top 10 defense in the country. So when they were making shots from the perimeter, they'd just kill you. They'd just beat you by 20, 30. But when they weren't, they could still like grind you out and guard you and, and 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 stay in the game when they were say shooting twenty two percent from three. They can't do that anymore. They they can't don't guard you like that. So if they're not scoring, they ain't stopping you. And that's how you end up with eight losses uh, before March first. Um, so that's the thing that I I would be concerned about. Uh, obviously, they score well enough to beat anybody, and they could beat anybody in a one game setting. But can they play four straight games w- without? having a terrible shooting night when combined with subpar defense, they just get got. I don't know. We'll see. For Kentucky, I uh, led the top 25 and one with them on Sunday because I reinserted them in it. I had not had them ranked before Sunday. And just sort of, this is nothing unique. It's not like, ooh, you wouldn't. Just tell me if you've heard this before. You have. They're, they're the most confusing team in the country, the most confounding team, bewildering team in the country. Like, um, it was they lose to LSU and then three days later shoot sixty three percent from the field and score a million against Alabama. Um, one game they're losing at home to Wilmington. Two games later, literally two games later, they beat North Carolina on a neutral. All right. Uh, one Saturday they're dropping their third straight game inside Rupp Arena for the first time in school history. Two Saturdays later they're embarrassing Alabama. I mean, I like it's all over the place, and. Yeah, you know, this is always easy to say. Like, if they could ever get that Auburn, the defense against Auburn and the offense against Alabama and put them together, well, that's the best team in the country. I agree. But if they they ain't done that yet, you know, they ain't done it yet. So I don't know that I'll pick them to go to a Final Four, but I will never rule it out because they have so much talent. And it's the they got more future NBA players than anybody. And there is actually history precedent for something like this happening. You know, that uh, 2014 team was just all season, all season, just up and down and up and down. They got an eight seed in the tournament. They then went to the final four. Yeah. And I, 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 will, I won't predict that to happen. I don't think. May, talk to me on Selection Sunday, maybe. Uh, but I can. it's easy to envision because if John ever figures out exactly the right lineup combinations to use and they – become a consistently okay defensive team. That's all it takes. Consistently okay. Maybe that's a little lower than it should be. Consistently respectable. Um, then then they can they can beat anybody and they could win a national championship. That said, they are still, even after that big win over Alabama, you ready for this? Six and seven in the first two quadrants. One game below 500 in the first two quadrants. And they also have a quadrant three loss to Wilmington on the resume. That's who this team is. What we saw on Saturday is what this team could theoretically be if it's really clicking the way it should be clicking. But what they actually are is six and seven in the first two quarters with the quarter three loss to Wilmington. Number one three point shooting team in the country, You're hitting forty one percent of its three pointers. That will be intriguing. Let me give you uh, let me give you five quickie results here. You take uh, whatever one you want to talk about. Uh, Torn around the weekend, Kansas beat Texas eighty six sixty seven. Uh, the news there is that self said afterward. Uh, he doesn't know when he's getting Kevin McCullough Jr. 
back. And I think he was referencing in the regular season. I think there's a, an expectation and a, a real hope that he'll be back uh, in the postseason. But he's got a, a bone bruise on that knee. Uh, that's something to definitely to monitor. UConn beat Villanova 78-54. It wasn't close. Tristan Newton got a triple-double thanks to an Alex Caravan three-pointer in the final minute. Really cool moment. Uh, Tristan Newton has four triple-doubles at UConn. He did not start his career at UConn. He leads the all-time uh, list of triple-doubles in the history of that university. And right now, he is the first UConn player to average more than 15 points and five assists per game since Khalid El Amin did it in 1999-2009. Keeping it what? What? I used to work with Colin. Yeah. I love him. Nicest guy in the world. This is so funny. So, like, we we worked together for, like, two straight years. And, you know, like, we sprinted over Adam Zucker, whoever's in studio. And it's like, uh, welcome to New York. Our studio's in New York City. I'm Adam Zucker. Alongside CBS Sports college basketball analyst Gary Parrish, uh, former NBA All-Star Wally Zerbiak, and the most outstanding player of the whatever Final Four, Khaled Alamein. He'd always be like, you know, like, right? And it just kept every time. And the most outstanding player of the, the whatever final four, call it LMA. He'd be like, yeah. So then, like, we're yeah. Yeah. 99. Yep. All right. I get them. They won so many. I can't keep track. Yeah. What do I look like? What do I look like? No escalators? Do I look, do I look like, do I look like no escalators? I'm not no escalators. What city was the 99 final four in? Lowell, Massachusetts. Give me, can you give me a real answer? 1999 final four? Yeah. St. Louis, I don't know. No, it's Tampa, but I don't know if technically it's over the bridge there. But yeah, that was it was in the baseball stadium in '99. Yeah, wow, that sounds fun. Yeah, I know, right? Random as hell. <laughs> anyway, continue. Uh, uh, continue, continue. All continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we, so it's like two years into this thing, and at some point, somebody was like, "So, uh, man, what was it like? Did you know you were going to be the most outstanding player of the Final Four? He's like, "Oh, I, I, I wasn't actually." <laughs> I go look it up. Somebody else won yeah, it. No, isn't it? Uh, is it Ricky Moore? I don't. I don't remember. Hold on. No, I gotta, is it Ricky Moore? Did Ricky Moore win 1999 Most Outstanding Player? Hold on. I'm looking right now. Uh, no, it was Rip Hamilton. Come on, Matt. Rip Hamilton, you idiot. God. Hey, hey. Now our CBS Sports colleague Rip Hamilton, who had his jersey retired <laughs> at UConn getting, this week. I was getting to that, but you were laughing about it. I'm, so I'm I, sorry. I Any, hey, I, hey. I'll screw up everything you've got planned for the court report. Right. Um, Ricky Moore was actually a baller though, and he was like necessary in that final four. So I just was, thought it was hilarious that Kyle just allowed us to call him the 1999 most outstanding player of the final four yeah. for two straight years without correcting us. <laughs> It'd be like if somebody were calling me and and I'm and I, uh, welcome to New York. I'm Brent Stover alongside Pulitzer Prize winner Gary Parrish, and I was just like, yeah, every time I'd just be like, yeah, roll with <laughs> just roll with it. I'm not looking to correct you <laughs> on the record there. Congrats to to Rip Hamilton. Why it? I don't know why it took 25 years. He won the night. Well, you know what? Maybe Khaled Alamine has actually been uh, running a, a, a silent campaign against getting this done, but he finally got his number retired in Gamble Pavilion. And uh, congrats to Rip Hamilton. He is a CBS Sports HQ colleague. Oh, by the way, talks NBA plenty. Cam Spencer, by the way, tied the season high with 25 in that game. Other two results I wanted to get you, uh, and then take it where you want from this, I guess. Uh, South Carolina just beat Ole Miss. Uh, they got back on the right track. Ole Miss is one of those teams I talked about, like Dayton. They have played themselves out of the tournament picture for now. Uh, South Carolina, 9-3 and three in quad one and quad two games. Meanwhile, the Rebels have lost 5-6. of six. And then uh, American action on Sunday. So South Florida has now won a school record 13 games in a row. Um, and it now is guaranteed a, at least minimally, it'll probably win it outright, but it's guaranteed a share of the regular season title. USF has never won any regular season title in its history. And, uh, it has been part of a league for about 45, 46, 47 years now. So congrats to Amir Abdurrahim. We've given him plenty of love in recent weeks. Uh, but because FAU lost at Memphis, uh, that is why FAU now, uh, mathematically cannot win the American Athletic Conference outright. Not that it was likely to do that. David Jones had 25 points, 11 rebounds, and Memphis kind of made it tight late, but uh, they were able to hold off there. So be it UConn, South Carolina, Memphis, Texas, Kansas, what, uh, what's your primary takeaway? Well, let's start on South Florida because it's it's terrific. And Amir is just, I mean, this is amazing, right? I mean, there's a lot of guys who have coached at that place. They ain't done nothing like this, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, and when you start doing things at a place that ain't never been done before, uh, that are traditionally hard to do, well, then, you know, people pay attention to that. Somebody's going to need a coach here in about a month or less. I'm wondering, yeah. And and he's going to he's gonna be on – He I, how about this? He should be. He should be on those lists. And I'll tell you, having spent some time with him, work, you know, he came in studio with us last year. 
and work during the NCAA tournament. He's just an impressive guy. Like, if you're a South Florida fan, you don't want him getting in front of an athletic director or, or a search firm. He's an impressive guy. Like, uh, impressive in person. Just And, and then the on-the-court stuff speaks for itself. Amazing stuff at Kennesaw State and now amazing stuff at, at who? USF. Hootie who? 21-5 and five against D1 opponents, 14-2 and two at home, strength of record 65, first place in the league, and probably, do you think they have an at-large chance? I do. I actually think now they got to win. I think they you would have to, to disregard everything you think about the selection no, no, process to no, include no, no, no. them. I want to. I want to. Here's what I want to. If they can get to no losses between now and at least the AAC semis, I want to see what everything reads like. Once, if they can get to the AAC semis without a loss, then I actually think it's intriguing. They don't have a great at-large case right now, and that's reflected in strength of record, everything. So, but if they continue to win, I just wonder how things may or may not, uh, you know, fall down around them in terms of other teams. But they got to do that first. So we'll see if they can even pull that off. What if I told you they have two more quadrant four losses than they have quadrant one wins, and that's because um, they have zero quadrant one wins and two quadrant four losses? Crazy, right? They and they're going to need to pick up. Uh, yeah, because Q fours are not going away, and that is those are anchors, man, big time. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great if you could make Q4s go away? You can't. Well, try, yeah. that'd be quite the world where, uh, quite the world. Okay. So, how do they get in? Uh, they, okay. So, they'll play the conference tournament on a neutral. And that means anybody in the top 50 of the net would be a quadrant one opportunity. But you ready? That's only for Atlantic. It's not. Okay. So, I, I, I'm wondering if, if either Memphis is in the uh, 80s. <sighs> Damn, dude, they're in the well. That'll refresh overnight. They're not going to jump high. And I wondered if SMU was uh was potentially. Maybe oh, that you might be right there. Let me look at SMU. SMU's in the forty. I apologize. Good correction. You got two. Oh, let me just look at this. Okay, yes, you do. That. They've got uh, uh, South Florida has at Charlotte next weekend. Then they're home to Tulane. Whatever at Tulsa. Yeah, they're, gonna, up, they're, they're racking up like they're going to have to get more power wins. But the thing that the committee historically has cared about too is they're going to have. Uh, a ton of road wins relative to other teams that would theoretically be fighting to get to Dayton. And so I'm not saying it's likely I'm not putting it out of the question. They might need to damn well make the title game without a loss. And if they lose there, we would really have an intriguing situation, but I'm not ready to say it's a 0% chance. That's all. Okay. And that's fine. Um, I, I hope there's a chance because it's a great story. Um, but in theory, they would only have based on current projections. There's only two teams and there's no guarantee that even play them. Yeah. But Florida Atlantic's 32 in the net right now. SMU's 40 on a neutral. Either one of those would be uh, quad one, but it's going to be hard. Sometimes with these teams that maybe don't have the predictive metrics numbers that you like or the actual quad one wins that you prefer, you can point to strength of record and go, hey, but just look at the strength of record. That was you know, now that we're talking AAC, that was Memphis early in the season. Yeah. If you looked at Memphis predictive metrics, it, they were not good ever. But they were in the top 10 strength of record at one point. The problem for South Florida is you can't even point there. Like they got all these wins and very few losses, and it's still 65 in strength of record. There's like no computer number that supports them. Nope. And they, they're going to need to get that. And I don't think, I don't know if they can. They're going to need to get that minimally into the top 45 from a strength of record standpoint. We'll see. Um, quick tour around the other results here, real quick. Uh, Rick Barnes, give him a hat tip. He reached uh, 800 career wins with Tennessee. I'm making an afterthought of Texas A&M. I told you last week I'm done with them. We can move along there. Mississippi State, oh, by the way, they won at LSU by 20. I just, you know, obviously not like a, a super attractive team. I get it. But you know what? They're 19 and 8. They have wins over Washington State, Northwestern, Tennessee, and Auburn. Chris Jans is uh, like it would it would it would take them reverting to something they haven't been. He's going to go two for two in NCAA tournament showings at one of the toughest jobs in the SEC. Good on him. Um, weird result. Texas Tech got dropped by UCF. UCF has three quad one wins, though, by the way. We talk about USF, zero. UCF has three. I uh, wonder if Johnny Dawkins is doing enough to save his job. Um, Penn State has swept Indiana, uh, 83-74. Oh, just, I'm bringing it up because as the weeks go on, I just... I'm getting more convinced that, that that they not that they should. I think we agree that they should, but they might be getting pressed to a decision there. Uh, Air Force beat New Mexico. That's your worst loss of the weekend, folks. That is quad four, 78-77. Um, Richard Patino, what in the damn world? Uh, that is brutal. Um, 
A couple of Mountain West teams took uh, unexpected losses. UNLV beat Colorado State. I don't want to say it was unexpected, but the teams projected to get to the tournament took some losses there. Uh, UNLV, by the way, is 7-1 and one in its last eight games. It has the best record in the Mountain West in that span. If you and, want and, a spoiler for the tournament, like... <laughs> What? I, I just love it. Every February, people say this about UNLV, and it never matters. What, in terms of spoiler? Oh, I, oh, but you got, the one thing you got to realize is, yeah. like, you know, the Mountain West yeah. Conference yeah. Tournament is going to be inside Thomas and Mack, yeah. and it yeah. never matters. Never. It's true. It's, it's, <laughs> it's true, but they have been winning as of late. And then uh, two more for you. Uh, Colorado beat Utah, double bubble game. Colorado helps us sending Utah's whatever. And then Seton Hall beat Butler, 76-64. Those teams are going in opposite directions. Palm doesn't have Seton Hall in the field. I, I'm pretty sure I'd have Seton Hall in as of right now. Butler is still narrowly in. Uh, Butler has lost five of six. Seton Hall has won five of six. But that's the thing, GP. This weekend, you had teams like Utah, Grand Canyon, Nova, Iowa, AM, Oregon, Cincinnati, Mississippi, Drake. A lot of these teams that were trying to get on the better side. Uh, took losses, and so yeah, it was uh, it was a little brutal for the bubble teams that were you know that seemed to have a lot at stake this weekend. That's and, all circle, and just to circle this back to the top, and then we'll look ahead of the next two nights. Um, that's exactly why you can't give up on St. John's yet, because these bu- other bubble teams are just like you know they they they're on the bubble for a reason. It's because they lose games they ain't supposed to lose, and as long as St. John's can keep winning and these other teams keep doing what they're doing, um, perhaps there's a path for the Red Storm to to get in the at large. Uh, conversation. Uh, you ready to look ahead to the next two nights? What do we got, bud? Oh, on Monday, um, you know, Mondays are always pretty uh, slow, but we do get good games, but it's usually slow. Not a lot, but good stuff. Miami at North Carolina. I mean, I don't know if you care, but at North Carolina. Yeah, that's probably going to get bad. That's, 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 let's, yeah. let's move on. Baylor yeah. at TCU. Buddy, you got to play Houston on home on a Saturday and go to then immediately turn around and go to TCU. That's yeah, that's a tough one there. I did move TCU in, into the top twenty-five and one on Sunday morning. You put them in? I did. I got to put somebody in. They look good no. as anybody else. Okay. All right. Uh, and then um, it's a game. West West Virginia at Kansas State. I only bring this up. I only bring this up because bubble teams are worthy of conversation. Kansas State is is a it? Bubble t- I guess it is, but well, uh, well, how about this? I don't. I don't. I ain't looked at um, where Jerry has them right now. I know they're out, and I don't know how far out they are. But we have consistently said, you and I, that you know, five hundred in the Big Twelve—that's a magic number. Like that, usually that, for a long time, nearly a decade, that's been guaranteed. That gets you in. And even though look- conference records don't matter, Jerry GP and I, uh, yes, of course, of course. In case like you're listening to a podcast for the your what your conference record is has zero influence on if you get in the tournament. None. Like John Rostein and I got into a, uh, an argument I, with with no not not with an argument with each other an argument not an argument even just a discussion with a, a fellow colleague in studio a couple of weeks ago and it was like well this team's something and something in the in the incident in the uh, in their league you can't put them in and it was like that league record is not even something they look at. They're just looking at the entire body of work. Your league record does not matter. And the other person in the studio was like, I, "That's crazy." And I'm like, oh, "I'm not. De- I, we can have a conversation about whether it's crazy or not." It was but JJ I, Watt, wasn't it? It was JJ Watt. It was Boomer Science. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It, it was. It was Boomer. It was Phil Sims. Okay. Okay. And I was like, Phil, like I get it, but you don't understand the selection process. <laughs> No, it was not Phil Sims. It was somebody who works in basketball with us. And I was like, listen, you might be right. It might be crazy. I'm just telling you, crazy or not, they ain't going to care about that at all. You're looking at the entire body of work. But what is true is that any team for nearly a decade that has finished at least 500 in the Big 12 has made the NCAA tournament. That's a fact. So if we are going to call that a magic number for Kansas State, and we have previously on this podcast multiple times because they didn't kill themselves in the non-league. They had a pretty good non-league. Um, well, right now they're they're six and eight in the Big Twelve after beating BYU. All right, they got to get the nine and nine. That's what we said. This is like maybe the simplest. Like you can see a finish line if you're Jerome Tay. They got to get the nine and nine. If they win against West Virginia at home, and they should, well, now they're at seven and eight with three games left. It's at Cincinnati, at Kansas. <laughs> And then at home against Iowa State, it ain't easy. I'm not telling you it's easy. But if you beat West Virginia, then all you got to do is win one of your next. What is it? Yeah. You what you 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 beat. So you 
I'm loving you figuring this out. I got to figure this out. You're six and eight right now. Yeah. You'll win, you win on Monday you're night. Six and eight with four games left. What record do you need to go to get to 500? <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out the best path. Where can we get these wins? At Cincinnati, Ed, can we get a win there? You're not going 500, GP. You don't know that. I do. They have to I'm go. not going to let you doubt Jerome <laughs> Tang like that. This was incredible to watch you try. They have to go three and one down the stretch. And it's roadies against Cincinnati and Kansas involved in there, and they're home against Iowa State, which is arguably a top 10 team. Not going to happen. They could do it. But they play West Virginia on Monday night. What else you got? I'm not going to – I'm not doubting – you can doubt Jerome Tang at your own rate. He's pr- hey, he's proved you wrong before. Has he? I mean, I – Yeah, I don't know. What else I, you I, got? I, I mean – Tuesday? He's proved, he's proved you wrong before. Tuesday. I don't know. On Tuesday, I'll be in studio for a triple header CBS Sports Network. Um, we got Davidson at Dayton, UNLV at Wyoming, the Dude, red hot running Rebels – the red hot running rebels, and then San Jose State at San Diego State. So we got uh, nationally ranked flyers, nationally ranked Az- Aztecs on our air on Tuesday. Elsewhere, Cincinnati at Houston. Good luck. <laughs> Good, <laughs> Good luck, Bearcats. Yes. You go. You gonna mess around? Look like Virginia on yeah. Tuesday night. <laughs> you gonna mess around? And do a Virginia impression on Tuesday night. Kentucky at Mississippi State. Come on. There we go. Oh, there. I, this is, poor John Calipari. This dude is riding a roller coaster with his own yes. fan base every week. Every week. That's worth turning into. That's, uh, that's a good spot for Mississippi State. Oh, that's too. great. That's a good spot. We'll see if they. BYU, uh, BYU at Kansas. Uh, no Kevin McCuller. So, and BYU got picked off. Uh, they took a weird one. I don't have it in front of me. Uh, did they? Where'd they lose? BYU lost this weekend. I can't remember. Sorry. I don't it was know. a bad one. They had to be eliminated from the top 25 and one. I will not put up yeah. with what they did this weekend. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to put up with it. Uh, Chris Beard Bowl, Texas at Texas Tech. At Texas Tech. Texas at Texas Tech. Texas at Texas Tech. Okay. There we go. Hey, show it to me if you can. I, I can. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's, 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 what's, that's what's happening there. <laughs> Texas at Texas Tech. All right. There we go. Uh, ne- Nevada at Colorado State. That's, that's, that's Another- getting CSU's got to uh, just win it to help you keep, make sure you wear your home whites in the tournament. Got to win that one, Rams. There's a lot of Mountain West slander out in the streets right now. I know. There's a lot of Mountain West slander yeah, out in the streets. Drop a home game to Air Force. What do you expect? That'll do it. That'll do it. I did a story on Air Force one time. Let's keep I, I, lear- I, I yeah, learned yeah. that uh, you, 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 <laughs> it's the hardest job in, in the world. Air Force in the Mountain West is the hardest job in the world. I, I mean, maybe. I, I, we don't have time to debate this right now, but there are a lot of tough jobs. That's the, the toughest. Hardest. It's yes. the toughest. It's the toughest. <laughs> okay. Dude, if you've got asthma, you, they won't even let you play because you can't fly a plane for the Air Force. Like you can, If you have any sort of little slight medical thing, it's like, nope. And, and and like most players don't even want to come there anyway. Tough situation. It's true. It is a lot of a lot of Mountain West slander out there right now. All right, is that it? You want to talk about the final four and one? I've... No, I don't. I got <laughs> I got to tell Steve Forbes. We're already late. I'm going to blame it on you. Oh yeah. All right. Well, I'll just I can send you everything he already told me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you didn't tr- transcribe any of it, and uh, so yeah, I'll I'll do that now. So wait My for tra- us to leave the the court report on Tuesday, everyone. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Terry M. F. and Teagle. He's a legend. Shouts to Huck Larnell. Shouts to Air Force. Why not? Why not? If you're not subscribed, Springs, good little place, by the way. Don't tell me. We spent time there, you and I together. That's right, we did. If you're not subscribed to the podcast, go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, including Apple and Spotify. There's more of us than there are of them. Make sure that's reflected in the comments. We're gonna talk to you on Wednesday. Till then. Take care.